Okay, the door is shut, so let's get this party started. My name is Scott Morrison, I'm a CA Technologies. I'm a distinguished engineer, which, yeah, I don't know what that means either, so, uh, you know, fill in the blank. Uh, but uh, I work for the Office of the CTO, and, uh, and I actually came in to CA about five years ago um, as part of the uh, Layer 7 acquisition. Now, Layer 7 was a company uh, that uh, I was part of the, the beginnings of uh, in Vancouver. We started about 16 years ago in API management and security. So I've got years and years of, uh, of work in how to secure communications between different systems. And, uh, and as of late, I've gotten really interested in things like, well, the blockchain. Um, and so this is, don't use the blockchain. And, and no doubt, you were thinking, Scott, WTF. I mean, blockchain, it's like the coolest thing. We got to use the blockchain. Well, here's what I really want you to get out of this, because I, I, I'm thinking you're probably in situations like this all the time, where you're standing there and, and you're talking to a developer and a developer saying, oh, we're going to do this, this, and we're, you know, we're going to do it all on the blockchain. And suddenly you're confronted with that, does this make sense? And, and so what I'm, my goal out of this whole thing is to kind of give you the ammunition so that you can look at this a little more critically and decide, does it make sense or not? Because blockchain is a fantastic technology for a certain kind of small class of problems. And, and the big problem these days is everybody thinks that's their problem, and very often it isn't. So we want to make sure that you're looking at it from the perspective of, is this thing fit for purpose? Now, now this is, this is of course, this is actually not a real XKCD comic. This is, I'm, I'm remixing the great Randall Monroe for my own uh, ends. Uh, he's a much smarter person than I could ever be. Uh, but, uh, uh, but great material all the time. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about trust, um, because trust is a foundation in all security, of course. And, and that's the, the sort of the focus and the lens that I want you to start to view what blockchain is about. Uh, we're going to talk a little about what the blockchain is about. There was another talk, I think, at lunch or something. Somebody did a blockchain talk. Uh, I wasn't there. I'm sure it was excellent. Um, you know, so consider this the sort of the counterpoint to that. Um, but obviously, we're both people that respect the blockchain and think it's pretty cool. Um, but uh, um, but I want to give you a slightly different um, contrarian view, I would imagine. Um, and uh, we'll talk about when it's a bad idea to use it. But then also, what's a good reason for using it? And obviously they are, because it's the foundation of things like Bitcoin. And, and then a little bit of further reading and we'll move on from there. So needless to say, blockchain is insanely hot. This is like a white hot technology right now. Everybody is, is talking about it all the time. And, and if you look at Google Trends, and I, I, I love Google Trends, because it gives you the snapshot into the zeitgeist to the world, like what people are looking for. Um, and, and you can get this really interesting curve in, in searches for blockchain. And, and it, it's like a classic exponential curve. It's like Moore's Law, you know, like increasing with this, this amazing hockey stick-like velocity. And then all of a sudden it drops off. Like it drops off back in like February, March time frame, which is kind of weird in that. So let's, let's dig into this a little more. And, and if we superimpose Bitcoin on top of that, um, you know, and that's the red curve right here, and the blue curve is still blockchain, you can see that really it's being exact, dragged along by, by interest in Bitcoin itself. And this really says something about, you know, the two things and how tied together they are. Blockchain is not Bitcoin, but Bitcoin uses blockchain. And so you almost can't talk about one without the other, although in a sense you should. And, and one of the things I want you to get out of this is, is what is blockchain from an the perspective of being an independent technology. A lot of people look at it as the really, really interesting part of Bitcoin and the thing that's, that's actually, in a lot of ways, more significant than Bitcoin. Um, now, of course, the reason for the drop-off is this. Um, if you actually look at what Bitcoin was going for, back in you know early part of this year, it was up to something like $20,000 uh, you know, a coin. So, so really, the interest in it, the interest in Bitcoin, and therefore, the pull along interest in, in blockchain has really been driven quite literally by the value of Bitcoin at, uh, at any one time. So, so again, difficult to sort of tease these things apart, but you know, we'll do our best as we go on. Um, bear in mind, I will be bouncing back and forth between these, these you know, two technologies really quite a bit. Now, this is a security conference, and, and you know, as all of us know in security, um, trust is the foundation of everything we do. And, um, and really, if you stop and think about trust, um, you can you know, go down some kind of interesting rabbit holes and things like that that lead to all sorts of places, especially if you start to really think about who you do trust. I mean, I like to think I trust my spouse. I actually really like to think I trust my kids, um, but both of them are teenagers now, so uh, uh, that comes and goes an awful lot, <laughs> depending on the time of day. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very sort of, I think, 
mutual kind of fungible level of trust. Um, all sorts of other things, obviously, like my boss. I actually really like my boss. He's the CTO of Layer 7, or sorry, excuse me, of, uh, of CA Technologies, and, uh, and he's a very trustworthy guy um, and that. And, you know, when I get down to the bottom, you know, the person I probably trust the most is just my housekeeper, who I, I actually give a key to the house so she can come in and do all this amazing work. And, and I view a pr tremendous amount of trust. And, and the thing is, you stop and think about that and, and you realize very often we, we infuse trust, we imbue trust into, into people without really thinking very deeply about that. And in an IT, we face this all the time. Um, you know, we've got contractors coming in that we give tremendous trust to with our data and, and such, even though technically they're not part of our, our organization per se. Um, you know, things like certificate authorities, of course, we, we use them all the time. We trust that they do things like protect their root keys because, of course, if a root key is compromised in a CA, you know, the, the, the whole thing falls apart, uh, as we've seen with, uh, you know, some... Uh, um, uh, you know, issues like uh, the Komodo fraud and things like that from many years ago. Um, so one of the biggest challenges in security, uh, I feel always, has been not understanding where we're embedding that trust, like no, not understanding where we're investing that trust and just assuming that things are okay. Uh, and that's where a lot of problems start to arise. And so I kind of want to use this as a lens. Um, I want to use trust as the mechanism for really understanding Bitcoin a little more and, and excuse me, blockchain a little more and, and by extension Bitcoin. Um, because really that's one of the fundamental pieces that uh, the whole thing is put together on. Now, human beings really, we're herd animals. Uh, we want to have a leader. Uh, we want to have somebody who's the, you know, the leader of the pack. And, uh, and of course throughout history we've been, you know, pushing up our leaders and tearing them down and, and, uh, and that. But the leader usually is the one who, you know, in the end, gets to sort of decide what the token of value is. You know, the king got to be the person who, you know, mints the coin of the realm, which is really a, you know, a token, ultimately, a token that represents value uh, that's associated with, well, whatever kingdom it was or whatever realm. And, uh, and, and, and the tokens themselves, you know, traditionally used to be of value themselves. I mean, they were gold or silver or what have you. Uh, we've obviously moved away from that, and so the token becomes representative of the overall economy of, of what we own. And we build, of course, institutions and things like that for kind of transmitting this value and, and actually being able to transfer the value back and forth. Um, you know, banks, of course, are, are central to all of that. And, and we create an illusion, really, of sort of trustworthiness around that. You know, the classic example of that, of course, is the bank, you know, like this, that, that has Greek columns in front of it, which was, you know, a very, very deliberate play to create a sense of solidity and, and timelessness. You know, nothing like, you know, a Doric column or something like that, the canthus leaves, or I guess the Corinthian column in this case, you know, to give that sort of sense of, of permanence, you know, and that sense of, Hey, it must be intellectual in there. These people must know what they're doing. I mean, we're you know we we can be we're very easily programmed as people, really. Um, and when I was a kid going into the bank, um, I used to love to sort of peer over the teller's shoulder. So I'm dating myself here because I used to actually talk to tellers back then. I used to fill out forms and things like that. Um, but I used to always peer over the teller's shoulder and and look into into the vault, and you'd see all this these different, you know, safety deposit boxes in there. And, and when I was a kid, I used to think that's where my money was. Like, I would hand over my, my $2 bill. I, I come from Canada, and we used to have $2 bills. Um, now we just have $2 coins. And, and, and I would assume that that was going into one of those little boxes. And, and I was always very disappointed that I didn't get back the same $2 bill. You know, because I assumed that it was just going in there and the bank was holding on, because they're really a custodian of my money. So why am I not getting the same money? But of course, they're not doing that. I mean, they're just... I'm doing a transfer of value um, to the bank, and the bank is a custodian of that, and that $2 bill went somewhere else or whatever, and it didn't really matter. But it was associated with an account number, um, just like these boxes are associated with an account number. And, and, and that idea of an abstract number being associated with my wealth, you know, which was, we're talking one, two digits, you know, when I, when I was young, um, uh, you know, is, is a very important concept. Um, because there isn't a sense of a physical place where things go as much as a number or which is a virtual place. And that number can really be anything. It can represent, you know, an account number. It can represent, you know, it can be bound to something bound to my ID, like my social insurance number. There's all sorts of interesting things that can happen from that. But it's a very kind of important and profound idea in this whole thing. 
The other thing that's really important is the whole idea of contracts. And, and you know, contracts are really, in a lot of ways, the foundation of how we've always done business. Uh, in fact, there's a great quote from the Harvard Business Review, you know, which said, contracts, transactions, and the records of them are among the defining structures of our economic, legal, and political systems. And it's very true. I mean, really, you know, that whole idea of the contract um, you know, being that basis of things like wealth transfer or transfer of, of goods and services and things like that um, is very profound because it's like, you know, the contract itself, like it's just a piece of paper. But we, again, infuse that with a certain amount of authority. And that, that infusion of authority in a transaction is actually, again, one of those very, very important ideas. Similarly, if we start to have lots of transactions and lots of contracts, we begin to put them together into like a book, a ledger. Um, and, and if you go back to you know, the origins of banking you know, in Venice back in the Middle Ages, I mean, Venice, when you think about it, was this, this amazing transportation hub and this amazing trading hub you know, between the East and the West. And, and you know, a lot of our current ideas about banking really came together because of the need for scale and transfer of value and wealth between you know, disparate um, parties uh, coming from you know, very different cultures and things like that. And the foundation of all of this, of course, was something simple, a book, a ledger, you know, which really takes all this information and kind of puts it into one place and, and gives us a whole bunch of, of essentially little entries which just you know, record for all time transfers, you know, transfers of value, transfers of wealth from one party to another. Very, very simple idea. But of course, the interesting thing about that and the interesting thing about the whole concept of a ledger is it's about concentrated power. It's about concentrating power into the hands of a few people who have access to the ledger. But in doing so, we actually create a concentration of risk because if that, um, that ledger isn't protected, somebody, of course, can come in and you know, put in false entries or something like that. Moreover, if that ledger is lost in some way, then we've got a real problem because, of course, we've lost all those transactions and all of a sudden, all that wealth is gone you know, done, off the, uh, off the books. So the obvious thing to do, of course, is create two ledgers, create a backup, and, and make sure those backups are in different huts <laughs> or in different banks or something like that. But then, of course, we've got a synchronization problem, which we all know in computing, synchronization's hard. It's hard to keep it uh, going. And, and moreover, as it gets more and more complicated, we run into massive issues in scale in that. and that. And these are sort of fundamental problems that, that blockchain really attempts to solve. And, and they're very fundamental ideas that, while on the surface they're very simple, the actual approach to solving these in a global distributed network is actually really, really cool and really, really quite interesting. So let's, let's dig into this for a minute, and I'll go quite fast over this, um, you know, because um, I know there's been other people talking about blockchain and things like that. But, but fundamentally what blockchain is, is it's simply the whole idea of a ledger, um, you know, but it's distributed. It's electronic, obviously, um, but it's massively distributed across the whole globe. And, and that creates the opportunity for a certain amount of transparency. It, you know, you can't have multiple copies that are a little different. All the copies are essentially the same. But it also means, you know, that there is no one central authority. Like there is no one, you know, central source of truth um, of any one copy. <clears throat> they're all they're all equally trustworthy um, in in the sense that all of them have the same information. And that's very, very important because that takes out of the hands of one person or, or one group the power of controlling the ledger and suddenly distributes it globally, which means everybody has access to it. And it sounds a little crazy and weird, but let's, let's dig into that and find out what this means. So if we take the whole idea of a ledger being a transactional history, um, it's, it's got to be very all-encompassing. Um, you can't have a ledger that skips things. Um, you know, forensic accounting, really, and, and the basis of all accounting is the idea of balancing the books. The idea that when you go back to the ledger, you can go through and find where everything went. And, and if somebody's doing a forensic audit, for instance, on a company, and they find all of a sudden there's missing money, this is because they've gone through ledgers like this, and they've said, stuff doesn't add up. And in the end, a ledger should be about transfers from one place to the other, but everything should be accounted for. There should never be any gaps. If there are gaps, that means there's some kind of malfeasance or incompetence or something like that going on. So it's very, very important that this is, this is not a lossy process. We, we actually keep all of the data, which is a very you know, time-honored accounting concept, but that's very different from what we're used to in computing. Think about that. 
Think about how a traditional database works. We're used to lossy information. Like when we build a relational database, we might do things like a bunch of transactions into that. I do you know, some SQL updates you know, for every one of these, these transactions. I deposit $25, I deposit $5, I take out $10, I deposit $15. Each of those could be a you know, simple SQL update into a relational database. Um, and what I'm doing is, is going into one table that actually has an account number and a total. And, and I'm actually making changes to that. Now, that's great in that it tells me what my total is at any one time, but the sense of all of those transactions is lost. In other words, the sense of time that, that um, uh, went into that and, and all the individual transactions is lost. And we do this all the time in computing traditionally because, quite frankly, it wasn't practical to have a log of everything that went on. And, and yeah, of course, there's, you know, seek, like a good modern relational database has a transactional log in that, but putting that aside for a little bit, this idea that we were willing to lose data in, in individual transactions as long as we had a total is something that we see throughout, you know, a lot of our technology. Um, even, you know, working on my PowerPoint here, uh, I make changes and things like that, and, and of course, if I want to revert those changes, I can do undo, 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 up to the point of my last save. And the minute I get to my last save, um, or if I save again, all of those undos are actually rolled up and lost. So I have no sense of being able to go back and, you know, undo something that I did, you know, I don't know, six months ago on this presentation or something like that, because that information was temporal and it was lost. The modern approach, though, I think, to, to working with data is we have the cloud now. And the cloud gives us virtually unlimited resources. And so we should be able to make use of those and keep all the data. And that's a profound idea. That's what came out of big data, really. That idea that, that as we commoditize storage and processing, we could actually literally hold on to everything. It's a very, very interesting modern concept and, and something we really just couldn't easily do for everything in the past. And, and of course, that's, that's the basis of so much of our new technology now, whether it's blockchain, as we're going to see, um, or else even things like, like um, um, modern um, uh, AI with neural networks, which, which can only work really because of their ability to harvest massive, massive amounts of data sets that we you know, couldn't possibly have in the past. So it's one thing to say we've got, okay, one of these ledgers, we, you know, uh, there's a line for every transaction and we distribute it globally, big deal, okay. Anybody can do that, that's not very exciting. Um, how do we trust it? Like how do we know that somebody in you know, Timbuktu isn't going through there and you know, altering that? How do we create that trust? So again, there's that lens of trust. Because we don't trust everybody on the internet. In fact, we certainly shouldn't. This is a security uh, conference, and, and most of us don't trust you know, any of us, really, because we, we just know too much about you know, the things that people could potentially do. And this is a quote, actually, from the, the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto, who's the founder of Bitcoin, the person who really put it together um, you know, in around 2008, 2009 timeframe. Um, nobody knows who this person is. I mean, there's theories. Um, but the person is a mystery, which is fantastic. It's, it's almost like a Bond villain. You know, like, you couldn't write this stuff. It's, it's brilliant. Um, but this person worked with, with a number of other people, consolidating a lot of ideas that were out there on the internet already, and, and came up with the concept of Bitcoin and the foundation of blockchain. Um, and, and this quote was in his writings that says, it's completely decentralized with no central server or trusted parties because everything's based on crypto proof instead of trust, which is very interesting. So in other words, we're using the basis of cryptography instead of central trust. And that's very, very different. That's not something you know, we've done as a society ever before. Now we can derive trust from that, um, but the trust isn't some, like, in other words, we're not, dependent on the trust uh, as, the, as the basis of all this. So let's talk about how that works because it's a really, really interesting idea. So let's start with a really simple transaction. Like let's say I got two people here. One is person A wants to send 10 units of something to person B. And the units can be anything. You know, they could be Bitcoins, they could be puka shells. You know, there's cultures in the South Pacific, of course, that have used shells and things like that for trading. Um, all, throughout human history, there's been all sorts of things, you know, tokens that we imbue with value that we, you know, we use in uh, transactions like this. So we'll, we won't even name this right now. Um, and, you know, person A has an account, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Um, so again, it's, it's just a number. Like, it's just, it's, it's a way of identifying, you know, where my, my, my value, where my wealth, where my coins, where my whatever, 
reside in that. You know, it's not a place. It's a, it's just an indicator. It's an indice more than anything else. And person B has their account 999, and we want to just send 10 units. And so obviously, the way to do that is to write it into the ledger. And, and in this case, it's just you know the date from to and the amount. So I'm not saying anything about how much I have. You know, person A has how much person B has. What I'm saying is this transfer has taken place. Now, what we want to do then is secure that transfer into the ledger. Um, and, and the ledger is broken up into things called blocks. Now, every person who does initiates a transaction, in this case person A, um, actually has to digitally sign that. And, and you know, of course, digital signatures are the basis of, of you know, all of our cryptographic operations these days. And, and you know, fairly simple to do, and we're very fortunate to have them. Um, so he, that person signs it to say unequivocally that they did that, because they're the only person who can, because they're the only person that actually holds the private key. Uh, for you know that particular account, and they actually submit that into you know the the block, um, and then the whole block, the integrity of the whole block, is put together by somebody called a miner. And, and a miner, the job of a miner, is essentially to sign that entire block and consolidate it into a piece. And and the size of a block isn't too important right now. So in other words, it's a way of taking one piece. Think of it as one page in a ledger, you know, that might be a book of multiple pages, and basically saying the integrity of this page is good, and, and they're putting their stamp on it. Now, the first thing you might be saying is, well, okay, so the miners have all the power. The miners can do anything they want. They could, you know, forge things. Well, they can't necessarily forge, they obviously can't forge my transaction, but they could copy it in twice, you know, they could do things like that. You know, if they're the arbiter of you know, the, the integrity of this thing, um, they could do all sorts of nefarious things. So more on that later. So keep that in mind, that the, the miners sound like an area that's uh, of possible risk. Now, of course, blocks can be run into chains, and, and chains are like the book. It's really just a way of binding, you know, the pages together into the ledger book, if you will. And each, you know, each page references the one before and the one before. And, and so you have this sense of, of continuity, you know, you have a sense of time, but you also have a sense of integrity. Um, you can't go and shuffle the pages, um, you know, because that would break the continuity. That would break the integrity of the chain. Uh, so it's very easy to check, you know, through standard digital signatures and, uh, and hashing and so on. Um, so there, there is this sense of, of continuity through there. And then we take this whole thing and distribute it globally. And, and why that's important is because all of a sudden we've created transparency. Um, so we've opened things up. We've basically said, here is the state of, of this, this you know, blockchain. And it's in many places. So anybody, anybody in this room can look at it, make sure that you know, all of the signatures add up and, and resolve the way they should. Um, anybody can make sure that, that there's not you know, weird forked versions of this thing. Um, and, and so having that global transparency amongst all players is actually really important because we're not we're not saying that there's any one person in control anymore. We're saying that everybody has an equal vote in this whole thing. Um, so that idea of re replication and transparency is actually really really important. Now that might seem a little weird in in the sense of okay we're following these chains and we're creating trust through chains. You know how do we know that works? Well, we do this all the time. Think of a scientific paper. You know I. I started my career in, uh, in um, medical imaging, did a lot of work in you know, kind of pure science and published papers in learned journals and things like that. And, and you, you certainly wouldn't get a paper published if you didn't have references, um, because basically what you're doing is you're, you're building on the global corpus of information, the global corpus of, of human knowledge. And, and, and if you haven't been referencing things and saying, this is where, you know, this is where the knowledge was at a certain point, and we're extending that, um, you know, your paper's not going to, when it goes through peer review, it's not going to get anywhere. And, and so every good paper has lots and lots of references at the back. And, and it's not possible, really, to go through and start to change references or, or change source material, particularly, because this material that's being referenced is in all over the world. Like, it's in, in libraries, in Palo Alto and Stanford and libraries up in Vancouver and the University of BC and things like that. So if I wanted to change knowledge by going back and changing this chain, I would have an insurmountable problem. I'd have to go to like every place that, you know, a particular journal uh, exists and swap in my faked version of a paper or something like that. And, and in doing so, I would have faked human knowledge or something like that. But it becomes insurmountably difficult to do. 
So we need something like that. We need to create that kind of problem of insurmountable difficulty in, in, in um, you know, making changes in that to our blockchains. Now, one thing to consider quickly, and, and here, aside from the, you know, I've been talking about the generic idea of blockchains, but, but think also about Bitcoin's use of it. Um, one thing to notice is there aren't any actual Bitcoins per se that exist anywhere. Like, really what we've got instead is this idea that there's transactions, and, and transactions move things from one place to the other. And there's ways of checking to make sure that, that you know, the, sor the source of a transaction actually has that amount of, you know, whatever you're moving, Bitcoins, Puka shells, whatever. Um, but it's not like they're physical Bitcoins, like a, like a coin that you've got in your pocket. It's not like they reside in any one place. It's really instead this abstract idea of value moving around. Um, and because of that, that actually gives us some interesting possibilities of what else we can do with this thing. So let me get back to that one point of, of um, um, how we prevent exploits and that. Um, People, individuals, anybody can join a Bitcoin network or you know, one of the other blockchains, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And, and they can create their own transactions and put them in. And then miners you know, work hard to build those transactions into, you know, into um, uh, ledgers, uh, into blocks, and, and in turn create those blocks and, and tie them into the global chain that's been going you know, since the whole network started. And, I mentioned earlier that there's this possibility that you know miners are single point of trust, and and couldn't a miner do something really difficult to like really bad to start to fake things, um, and and the answer is potentially, but they thought of that, and uh, and and there's an interesting trick um, in used in Bitcoin and used in a, a number of other uses of blockchain that basically forces the miners to be trustworthy because one way to gain this system, of course, is what's called a Sybil attack, which is you just if anybody can be a miner, and any one of the any one of you could be a miner, you could sign up and say, "Yeah, I'm going to you know, use my my laptop and start to mine bitcoins and you know put together these." It doesn't seem very hard. All I have to do is you know do signatures on on things, and, and indeed it isn't very hard. Um, so in theory, what you could do is just get a bunch of supercomputers or something and try to dominate the network and and basically create enough computing power that you could start to inject you know your version of truth. You know, which might not be a good version of truth, into the system. You know, just like running around to all the libraries and trying to change the, uh, the journals. Here's how that's avoided. Um, there's a really interesting idea, and this is one of the profound things in Bitcoin, and you, you see it in a lot of other uh, implementations of uh, blockchain as well. Um, it uses a, a technique called proof of work, um, where essentially all miners are created equal because they, in order to commit something to the chain, they actually have to solve a really, really difficult problem. And in this case, the problem essentially is you have to be able to do uh, a hash of all the information that you're signing, include a nonce in it, which you just guess, like it's just an arbitrary piece of data, and then come out with a result with a bunch of leading zeros on it. And you're probably thinking, what the heck is that? That's insane. But there's method to this madness. The whole idea of this is because it's a hash, remember, you can't actually reverse a hash. You can't actually say, this is the hash I want. I want to go back and be able to derive you know, what came out of it. Hashes are ultimately one way. The only way to compute this is randomly. You can just randomly pick out numbers for your nonce, try the hash, see if it works. If you're lucky, the hash comes out with a bunch of leading zeros on it. If you're not lucky, guess again, try again. This is what mining is about. Mining is about trying to solve this problem. And the first miner of all the ones all over the world who basically managed to manages to solve this for a new block puts up their hand and says, bingo, I got it, I got it. And everybody else goes, ah, just like in bingo. OK, that person won. They've done a lot of work. They were lucky. Um, they get to commit you know, that block in there. Um, and, and as a result, they actually get rewarded a Bitcoin, or they get awarded some kind of value. Um, so there's, there's an intrinsic incentive built into the system. Now, you may be wondering, like, what's the point of all that? The point, really, is to make sure that no one party can dominate the network. Because remember, it's a guessing game. You know, I have as much chance as you do, as much chance as anybody in this room does, of making that guess and getting the right guess, you know, right now on a, on a particular transaction. Which means if I get it now, Odds are I'm not going to get it again. 
and you're, you're probably going to be the next person or somebody else. So uh, there's no way I can begin to dominate this unless I can get enough computational horsepower to actually be able to swamp all of you. That's why you hear about miners getting, um, you know, putting together all of these systems and things like that in China, up in, in Canada, actually. It's, it's a very interesting place. It's a, uh, it's a ghost town um, called Ocean Falls. And it, it was originally a pulp mill, and they happen to have their own hydroelectric dam there because, um, you know, pulp mills, you know, use a lot of power. Um, but, you know, the whole economy collapsed there, and, and literally this town is isolated. And they've been trying to figure out what to do with it for years, because there's no roads in there. It's up on the coast, uh, about 500 kilometers north of Vancouver. Uh, and it's in the middle of nowhere. The only way to get in is by plane, like float plane, or by boat. Um, but you see pictures of it. This is like this crumbling ghost town circa, you know, 1970s, 1980s, or whatever. But they have enormous amounts of power, because the, the dam is still running. And there's a few people that live there. Guess what? Bitcoin miners moved in there, or one in particular. And, and they're using cheap hydroelectric power to start to you know, create lots and lots of computer systems where they can do this guessing game. Uh, doesn't mean they can game the global network, because nobody can. That's the beauty of this. There's so many people involved, nobody can get an upper hand. So it's ultimately fair. So consensus, then, is, is really a game of, of who guesses this stuff first, but then having the transparency of the whole world looking at it and validating that. So if you're a bad guy and you try to game the system, and you might be able to get one block that you've been able to game, but pretty soon, you know, your the things you've been doing, you know, incorrectly in there, like double spending and stuff like that, will get noticed. And at that point, your stuff gets thrown away. So you're in, you have no incentive to be doing that because, quite frankly, it'll get caught every time. So there's a great beauty in the whole transparency of the whole thing. Now, the interesting thing about this, of course, is it's really um, a game of consensus and, um, and, and this whole idea that essentially we're, the system will settle down to a common truth over time, but it's not instantaneous. And in the early days of computing, or even until very recently, that's not the kind of thing we did. I mean, computing was all built on the idea of transactions. Things happened, and if they didn't, they rolled back. I mean, acid transactions and all of this technology that we've put for so many years into like relational databases and things like that is based, is predicated on that idea of synchronized truth, like there is a source of truth. When the cloud came out, though, like in the you know early part of the 2000s, Cloud's predicated on this idea that distributed computing is really hard. Um, and so we can't necessarily have this kind of ironclad, everything is in sync all the time, everything just works sort of idea. Instead, we have to have this idea instead of eventual consistency. And so we saw, saw the rise of, of you know, NoSQL databases and, um, and the idea that, that you make a change and it may not be instantaneous. It may take 10 seconds, a minute, 20 minutes or something to really kind of settle in into truth. And for a while, that was hard to deal with because as IT professionals were used to, like, no, it's instantaneous. Everything has to take place instantly. But more, more and more, people began to see the value of things like NoSQL databases where you didn't necessarily get instantaneous truth, but you had other values. You could scale massively, ridiculously. You know? And so we had ideas like the CAP theorem, of course, which brought in the idea of trade-offs, where you know, the CAP theorem said we could have any two of the three qualities of you know, consistency, availability, and partitioning. And, and we optimized different databases for different scenarios. Look at the difference between Mongo and Cassandra, for instance. They're fundamentally different in how they settle into data, and, uh, and that, even though they're both NoSQL databases. So this idea that things aren't instantaneous, but will settle down to truth over time, is a very modern idea. But it's very fundamental, I think, you know, to stuff like Bitcoin. Now, you can think of the whole thing, really, as, as, a, as a layer on top of the internet. Um, and, and that's kind of interesting, because it's almost like a, a network on top of the network. And like the TCP IP network, nobody really owns it. Like, you can argue that, oh, well, people own the transmission links and things like that. But the whole point of the internet, of course, is it's massively distributed. And, and there's no one authority that runs the whole thing. I'm going to skip this quickly. So, so in the end, this is what we've got. We've got this replicated with blockchain, you know, a global digital ledger. Uh, we have a means of consensus, that, that number guessing game I showed you. Um, there's other approaches to it as well, by the way, but, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about those later if we have time. Um, and, and 
And we've got a method so that it's very, very difficult to go back and change historical records uh, because of that, that transparency and that global distribution and that, and, and the cryptographic integrity that really holds the whole thing together. So that's a very powerful idea. And so you may be thinking, wow, let's use this for everything. And I, to that, of course, I would say, whoa, cowboy, let's stop and think about this for a minute. What is blockchain not good for? Because everybody thinks it's great for everything. Everybody thinks, oh, this is the greatest you know, distributed global database ever. So let's look a little deeper. Um, Ray Valdez from Gartner actually has, um, has a great quote. 90% um, of blockchain projects in the enterprise would be faster to build without blockchain. They're fundamentally centralized projects mistakenly using a fundamentally distributed technology. Uh, and, and in fact, blockchain is like, on Gartner's network, is like the most searched term pretty much. It's, it's you know, people are mad about this, this stuff. Although, you know, I would, I would imagine it's starting to shift over into AI and things like that now. Um, but it's a very valid con uh, it's concept because too many people jump in to using a technology like this simply because of the cool factor and because, as, as Ray Valdez says, it's not a business problem, it's a CTO problem. It's typically the technical people think this is great and they want to show off what they're doing, but they're not actually adding a ton of business value. And moreover, when you stop and think about it, most institutions, enterprises in particular, you know, I work for CA Technologies, a you know, classic hierarchical enterprise, um, we're centralized. We centralize our authority. We centralize our trust in that. And so something where trust is massively distributed actually very often you know, doesn't fit really well. It's also, the technology itself is really complicated. Yes, there are simple APIs to be able to use some of the blockchain technologies like Ethereum and, and such, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's a good idea just to use it without thinking about the ramifications of what's going on. Um, another great quote, if your requirements are fulfilled by today's relational databases, you'd be insane to use a blockchain. Uh, this is from Gideon Greenspan, who's actually in a blockchain company, you know, when he said this. Um, so this is somebody who's, you know, invested obviously in people using blockchain, um, but is very much a realist and wrote a very, very good uh, article here called, you know, Avoiding the Pointless Blockchain um, Project. Um, so again, it's really fundamentally the technology and the business value don't necessarily line up, and, and, and that can be a, a big issue. One of the issues is speed. So blockchains are slow. It takes a long time to achieve that consensus. It takes a long time to get that eventual consistency. I mean, Bitcoin actually like, quite literally runs like, uh, you know, it's a little faster now, but you know, a few transactions a second on the public chain. Ethereum is faster, but 15 transactions a second? Like, you know, look at what you need for, you know, Shanghai Stock Exchange needs like 80,000 transactions a second. Like, how do you build on something like that? Now, there are a lot of research, obviously, in speeding these things up. And, and if you move to something called permissioned blockchains, which are a private blockchain where the consensus model is very different, um, you can basically, you know, s speed things up a lot. But in terms of a distributed, you know, data store, they're actually pretty slow in that. So. The problem is, is that many people look at blockchain as this sort of fundamental thing that's changed distributed computing, as a sort of solved the, you know, great conundrums of, of distributed storage. And in a lot of ways, that's the wrong way to look at it. It has, yes, it does some very interesting things in terms of distributed storage and being a distributed database, but it's one with very particular qualities in that. And in fact, most, we, we've already solved the problems in a lot of ways of doing good distributed persistence. I mean, there's great, you know, um, um, you know, data stores like, like Mongo and Cassandra and, you know, HBase and, and uh, you know, Hadoop's fi file system. And, you know, we've been doing this for years and, and we're getting pretty good at it. And, and we're also pretty good at understanding the, the pros and cons of these things. And quite frankly, they're an awful lot easier to use and set up than, you know, a lot of uh, um, blockchains. So you have to really stop and ask yourself, am I just using this because I think it's a cool data store? Or am I really using this because I need those, those characteristics of, of the differing trust model uh, that, that really is the foundation of, uh, of what blockchain is about? Um, another one is, well, I just need a secure log. You know, I need a global log where I can put data in, um, you know, into a ledger and I've got, you know, I don't lose any data. It's, um, you know, it's, it's I, I have a record of everything that's gone into it. Um, and again, laudable goal, because that's part of you know, what we're doing now in, in uh, computing is record everything. We don't want lossy data. We, don't, we, want, that, we want to be able to replay, essentially, uh, state at any one time. We want to be able to go back through a log and say, you know, on 
December 24th, 2005, this is the state of the network because I can you know, essentially reconstitute it from the component parts of all those different transactions. It's a very, very powerful thing. But again, blockchain, you know, we can do that with something like Kafka, like a great um, technology that came out of LinkedIn for, you know, creating a distributed log. You know, it doesn't necessarily have the characteristics in terms of trust and anybody being able to read and write to it that blockchain has, but it's a phenomenally great transaction log actually, that, uh, you know, is, is, again, another one of the, the hotness things that people use out here all the time. So that brings us around to something and saying, okay, Scott, you're, you're poo-pooing all these great blockchain things that I was going to do. So what is it really good for? Um, one of them is chain of custody. Um, you know, in manufacturing, if you create, you know, a digital token when something is manufactured, for instance, and, and that, that is an analog that represents that thing that you've created. And every time the thing changes hands, you, put a, you log that into the transaction database. Um, that way you can actually trace its journey from where it's manufactured to you know, being handed off to a shipping company, to hand it off to a distributor, to hand it off to a store, to ultimately hand it off to a consumer or something like that. And there's a digital trail showing every one of those handoffs. And if something goes wrong along the way, you've got, again, the ability to do some kind of forensic audit so you know, oh, something's missing here. The books don't balance and that. So very, very powerful idea here. Um, again, very similar to the chain of following the money. Another one is anywhere you need truly decentralized control. So in other words, you don't want any one person or parties hogging the system and being the people that we have to trust. Um, so in other words, everybody gets a vote. Everybody is created equal. People can come and go. You know, that was the profound idea about Bitcoin is anybody can create an account on Bitcoin. You can create hundreds of accounts on Bitcoin. Um, you may not have anything in them. You have to put stuff into them. But it's not like you have to go to the bank and say, fill out forms in triplicate and say, please, you know, create a, an account for me. Um, literally, anybody can do it instantly. Um, and your account number is, is quite, you know, quite literally the public key of your public-private key pair. Kind of a neat idea. Um, so di distributed control like that or or decentralized control excuse me is really powerful because that is the basis of course of being able to do money and and being able to do something disruptive like bitcoin which fundamentally was built to disrupt our entire concept of money and what it was about and who controlled it because our current economic system is all based on what are called fiat currencies they're all controlled essentially by central authorities central banks in countries and that was exactly what the you know designers of bitcoin really wanted to get away from um, anywhere also where you want to eliminate middlemen. I mean, we've got all sorts of institutions where middlemen exist for the sole purpose of brokering between one party and another. And they become trusted by both parties, and that's their value. So again, if you can get rid of that need for that trust to make it electronic, make it cryptographically secure, all of a sudden entire brokerage industries just go away because they're not providing that, that value of the, the sort of pseudo-trust that they actually uh, create. Um, also. Where you decentralize data, but you have to keep records across lots of different organizations. Um, this happens all the time in large enterprises. You have different business units, for instance, uh, which tend not to work well together. Um, so if you can essentially make them all work, you know, and make them all equally accountable, um, that's a powerful thing. And, and so it's very good for that kind of information sharing, um, you know, which is a perennial problem in any kind of organization. The other one that I think is really exciting is identity. Um, you know, when you think about it, all of our identity today really goes back to some authority. Um, I have, you know, an email address at CA. It's MORSC04 at CA.com. <laughs> I didn't come up with that. You know, only, only a large organization could come up with something as inelegant as that. And it's, you know, like this combination of my last name, my first name, and I guess I'm the fourth one that, you know, had that. Um, and, and, you know, you get it. I, any large organization is going to cycle through lots of people. They need a formula. So, you know, they have some sense of being able to figure out who's who. Uh, fortunately, there's aliases as well. So if you want to get a hold of me, I'm also scott.morrison at ca.com. Um, and, uh, but um, I also, of course, have things like 
you know, my driver's license. Um, I flew down from Canada today, actually, and, you know, what do I do? I pull out my passport. The passport is issued by Canada, and, and I was allowed into the U.S. because we have reciprocal arrangements where, you know, the U.S. trusts Canada, Canada trusts the U.S., that, you know, we trust the integrity of our systems to validate identity and, and make sure that, you know, when, when, you know, a passport is minted with my picture in it, that it's valid um, and, uh, and that. But again, these all go back to trusted institutions and that. Um, Blockchain, in contrast, is about any individual being able to make claims. Um, and, and so there's some really interesting technology around this. Um, you know, things like, um, uh, technologies like Civic, um, Muport is another one. Um, they're doing some super, super cool um, stuff in, um, um, you know, some of the refugee camps in, in Jordan, actually, where they get waves of Syrian refugees coming in. All of a sudden, people with very, very, you know, you know, potentially very little identification in that. And, and they've got to take, like, they've got to be able to process them quickly. Um, and they'll do things like, you know, um, process people by doing retinal scans. And then essentially they um, give people money to survive in the refugee camp, uh, so, um, you know, associated with their blockchain identity, which is bound to their, their retinal scan. So they can, like, somebody living in a refugee camp can then go in, go to the local store, buy, you know, fresh vegetables or something like that, you know, based on the money that's come in from, you know, the UN into that refugee camp associated with that person. So you cut down on fraud massively, which is a huge issue, like, like fraud and loss, you know, corruption and that is a massive issue in, uh, in you know, any kind of, uh, of uh, you know, relief efforts. And, and this, again, allows quick and easy identity. Uh, so really one of the most interesting areas. So hopefully, and... Uh, uh, by the end of this, this is what you're going to do when you're faced with this. So take a look at it and you know, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I think this is the coolest thing. Dig in deeper. Dig in a little deeper and ask them, does this really make sense for me? So uh, a couple of things in further reading. There's, really, there's lots of great references out there. Um, I happen to you know, use these a lot in this presentation. Um, I really liked these. I thought they were all very, very well done. And uh, so thanks everybody for your time and I hope the rest of the conference is great for you. Thank you. Thank you.